continuing our journey in chapter 13, we're going to start talking about shifting equilibria, or section 13.3 uh, out of the OpenStax textbook. So there's the learning outcomes and expectations. Feel free to pause and read through those before we continue. All right, so 13.3, we're going to talk about shifting equilibria, uh, and the primary descriptor of this is using Le Chatelier's principle. And so it turns out not only can we, you know, describe a system in terms of equilibria, and it'll reach it based on the rates forward and rates reversed. We talked about rates constant and manipulating them in Q versus K. And now that we understand it, again, we're going to do this effort to shift it or understand how parameters that we poke the system or perturb it influence the equilibria towards hopefully a means that we, we're excited about. And so really the foundation of this, this idea of shifting equilibrium goes back to Le Chatelier's principle. And so Le Chatelier came up with this idea, um, basically when a chemical system or, or at equilibrium is disturbed, it returns to equilibrium by going a net reaction that reduces the effect of the disturbance. And so there's Le Chatelier sporting the 1880s buzz cut. Um, Le Chatelier said if we perturb a system, it wants to go back to equilibrium, which makes sense. Again, we talked about rate forward versus rate reverse, if we mess that up, it wants wants to go back to that condition. And so again, the steps are system is at equilibrium, we've reached a plateau, we perturb it somehow, and there's various different stressors that we can apply to it, and it's no longer at equilibrium. Le Chatelier's principle says the system will respond accordingly, and it'll try to return to that equilibrium condition. And so the, the stresses we're going to talk about are concentration, volume, temperature, and adding a catalyst, and how those are going to perturb a system at equilibrium. And so let's talk about concentration. And then in this case, concentration in the terms of adding, removing reactants or products. And so let's say we have this reaction A plus B giving C plus D. A system is at equilibrium. We have an equilibrium constant. It's going to dictate the concentration of products over reactants. Now, when it's at that steady state condition, those ratios are going to stay the same. The, the amount of product, the amount of reactants on average is going to stay the same. A, a will turn into A plus B will turn into C plus D, but the total concentration stays relatively constant. But let's say we just reduce the concentration of A by half. We have some way to magically pull out A from the solution. We can do it through condensation or extraction or various different ways. Let's get rid of the A. And so the system will no longer be at equilibrium, right? Because we have changed this ratio between the two. And so we've effectively reduced A by half, so multiply it by 0 0.5. And all of a sudden, we don't have enough of reactants. We have more than enough products. And so in this case, Q is going to be later than, greater than K because we have decreased this. This is going to be too much. This down here is going to be too small. And so Le Chatelier's principle says we've perturbed the system and it wants to go back to equilibrium. Now, the only way it can do that is if it gets rid of some of this product by converting it to reactant. Remember, Q is greater than K. This number is too big. The denominator is too small. The only way to fix that is convert C plus D into A plus B. So the reaction will proceed to the left. And so that's exactly what will happen. The concentration of A and B will increase. C and D will decrease until it gets back to a condition where Q equals K. And so the thing to note about this is add or remove products and react is all you want. K is not influenced by those changes in concentration. K is the equilibrium constant. Remember, it doesn't change at a given temperature. And so what we're changing is not K. We're just changing it so it's no longer at that K equilibrium condition. Instead, we've perturbed it to where it's at Q. And so Q is a non-equilibrium condition if it doesn't equal K. And Q is going to, the reaction will shift to return to that equilibrium. And so we can use a real world example of this, this PCL3 plus CL2 going to PCL5. Here's an equilibrium stoichiometry 1 to 1 to 1. There's the equilibrium constant expression. There's a number associated with that. Let's say it's at equilibrium and we're going to distress the system by adding some CL2. And the system's going to no longer be at equilibrium because we've made this number too large, which in that case means Q is less than K. The denominator becomes too big. Uh, the numerator becomes too small. There's too many reactants, not enough products. The reaction will turn some of those reactants into products. And so we'll expect that PCL3 will go down, CL2 will go down, and PCL5 will go up. And so that's what you'd exactly see if you did this experiment. So let's say you have a mixture of uh, PCL3, CL2, and PCL5. So there's the PCL5, there's PCL3, CL2. You mix those together, you let them sit, and you found that at equilibrium, there's the concentration PCL5, there's PCL3, and there's CL2. 
And now we're going to perturb the system and we're going to do it right here. We're just going to inject CL2 into the system, like uh, via gas phase syringe, we're going to put CL2 into the system. And so instantly that CL2 concentration is too high. And so what would we expect from Le Chatelet's principle? We would expect Q is less than K, the reaction will proceed right. So PCL3 and CL2 should go down, which is exactly what you see, and the PCL5 will go up. And so you'll notice it's not at equilibrium in this white region, but it's approaching that equilibrium. And so we had an original equilibrium, we perturbed it, it's responding, it reaches equilibrium again, we have a plateau where Q equals K. And so again, Le Chatelet's principle, we poked and perturbed the system, the system responded and went back to a plateau equilibrium, we could poke it again by removing something or adding something and the system would respond accordingly. And so here's the tabulated basically idea behind that. And you can go through and look th through this equilibrium constant. And you can say, how will it change it? How will it change Q relative to K? But the general idea is if you add products, it's going to shift left. If you remove products, it's going to shift right because you're changing this uh, numerator here. Um, add reactants, it's going to go right. Add pro uh, remove reactants, it's going to shift to the left. And so again, it's, it's, it's trying to reach equilibrium, right? We've we've perturbed it, and we know and we know how it's going to respond. And so you can think about that in terms of like chemical engineering. If you're running a factory and you want to generate C and D, what do I have to do to generate more C and D? And so I would add A and B, or I would extract C and D, and then I would be able to sell that, right? And then I generate more C and D. And so you can actually control this shifting it left or right depending on what you add to the system. And so you can control product generation. And so again. Um, one thing to note is that, remember with our equilibrium equation, if any of these are solids or liquids, they don't show up in this equation and they also don't perturb the equilibrium. And so liquids and solids, pure liquids and solids, if there's an L or an S after these, this doesn't apply, right? Because adding more L or more S doesn't change anything as we talked about in the previous presentation. And so you could memorize the rules or calculate Q every time or look at the equation. Um, I propose an alternative strategy, and this is one I, I published over a decade ago. It's Le Chatelet's principle and Newtonian analogy that makes sense. Um, basically, I had this idea of visualizing this uh, equilibrium as a seesaw, right? And so we have a seesaw with A plus B on one side and C plus D on another. And you can imagine there's the products. And so the way I visualize this or think about it in my head is if we're going to increase the amount of A, I'm just going to put an arrow next to A and I'm going to pull up on that arrow. And what's going to happen to my reactants and products? They're going to shift in response to me pulling up on that arrow. And so if you're adding A, it's going to roll to the right. You add D, it's going to roll to the left. You decrease C, it's going to roll to the right. Decrease B, it's going to roll to the left. And so this is exactly the same thing we've talked about. This is just really quick shorthand notation saying if I add A or B, shifts right. Add C or D, shifts left. Remove C or D, shifts right. Remove A or B, it shifts left. And so it's not an entirely inclusive Newtonian analogy because you are adding things here, but I'm asking you to pull up. But that's the idea. Think about the arrow causing the seesaw to increase or decrease according to adding A and B or C and D. And so it gives you a really quick and easy way to say which way is it going to shift. All right, so that was concentration, right? If we add products, it shifts left. Add reactants, it shifts right. It's going to respond to get back to that equilibrium condition. Now, another way we can change the system is volume, which turns out is actually another concentration change. Um, and so we talk about gaseous molecules. And so changing volume doesn't affect liquids or solids, but it does change gas molecules. And so let's say we have an equilibrium, blue sphere, yellow sphere, green sphere, they're in equilibrium inside this chamber. And let's say I squeeze that chamber down. And effectively what I've done is I've lowered the volume and I've increased the pressure inside that chamber. And so we have to ask ourselves, how is this going to respond? And the answer is we've changed the concentration, but we've done it rather than adding something or adding more moles of something, we've done it by changing the liters. And so what we've effectively done is changed the volume from whatever this is to a smaller volume that looks like this. And so the number of moles of things, at least instantaneously, has not changed, but the volume has changed. And so when we think about our equilibrium, we have products over reactants. Each one of these is moles per liter. What we're doing here is we're effectively changing the amount of liters, right? We're changing the volume of all three of these parameters. But two of those will cancel out, and you'll have one remaining. And so what this effectively does is it makes the liters, the volume, smaller, 
which makes this number bigger, which makes Q smaller, and that makes Q less than K. So squeezing down the chamber, we're changing V, which changes the concentration, and if Q is less than K, the reaction has to proceed to the right. And it's doing that, it's basically gonna go to the side with less gas molecules. Why? Because these liters cancel out, this liter has an influence. And so note, if there's two moles per liter up here and two moles per liter down here, liters cancel out entirely, changing the volume doesn't matter. But if there's an unequal number of gas molecules on each side, reducing the volume, uh, decreasing the volume is effectively going to shift the equilibrium to the side with less gas molecules because of this reason. Conversely, if we make the chamber bigger, we're increasing the volume, we're effectively making the volume higher, the liters in the equation higher, and we're making the concentration lower. But we're not doing so across the board, right? And so effectively, these two have canceled out, we're making this number larger, which makes this number smaller, which makes Q greater than K. If Q is greater than K, it shifts to the left. Another way to think about it is you know you're like pulling a vacuum right and it needs more gas molecules to occupy it it's going to generate more gas molecules to shift it to the left from one gas molecule to two gas molecules and so in this case, changing the volume is changing the concentration, but you can also think about it in terms of which way will it proceed? Will it want less gas molecules or more gas molecules? It depends on if you made the volume bigger or smaller. And so again, just like our previous one, this only impacts gaseous species, not liquid or solid or aqueous in that case, because this is, I mean, gas is the only one really affected by a volume change until you start really pressing on a liquid, but we're gonna ignore that for the sake of general chemistry. And so to summarize changing volumes, we can increase the volume, it'll shift to the side with uh, more moles of gas, in this case it'll shift to the left. If you decrease the volume, it's squeezing it down, it's making it more concentrated, it's going to shift to the side with the fewer gas molecules, or in this case it'll shift to the right. Again, like the concentration change, changes in volume do not change the value of K. Again, it's changing the liters, but it's K is an equilibrium constant. At a given temperature, K is always the same thing, and so you're not going to change that at all. But note, like we showed earlier, if all those liters cancel out, changing the volume doesn't matter. And so if the number of gas gaseous molecules on both sides of this equation is equal, Increasing the volume, decreasing the volume doesn't matter. There's no advantage in making more or less of these products or reactants because you have gas molecules on both sides of this equation. I apologize, that should be a D. As written, these two will cancel out, but you get the idea. If there's two gas on this side, two gas on this side, or A and B and two Cs on this side, it's going to cancel out and there will be no shift in the equilibrium with a volume change. All right, so that's volume. So let's get into temperature. And so temperature we know perturbs uh, rate constants, right? We talked about the Arrhenius equation. We know that these two here, the rate constant for the forward, rate constant for the reverse, that is proportional to the temperature, right? And it's through this Arrhenius equation. And so as temperature goes up, rate constant goes up. As temperature goes down, rate constant goes down. But when you change the temperature, it doesn't change these two equally, right? It's gonna change these numbers. And so temperature is one of the unique things that actually changes the value of K. And because these lowercase k's are temperature dependent through the Arrhenius equation, uppercase k is temperature dependent because these guys are not proportionally temperature dependent. One of these is going to be affected more than the other. And so it's going to depend on whether the system is exothermic or endothermic. And I really should draw the reaction coordinate diagram, uh, but for the sake of time, let's just keep it simple. And let's say if, if if a reaction is exothermic, essentially you can add heat as a product on that reaction. And so what that tells us, if say um, it's endothermic, it means heat is gonna be on the reactant side. And so if it's releasing energy, it's a product. If it's taking in energy, which means endothermic, it is adding uh, heat to the reactant side. And so this would be a positive delta H, this would be a negative delta H. That tells you where the heat is gonna be on this reaction. And so we can make a prediction based on our seesaw analogy or how this might shift. If we increase the temperature of this reaction, we're essentially generating, we're adding more product. And if we add more product, we know that we have to pull up on this side, the seesaw shifts left, it's gonna proceed to the left. If instead it's a, if instead we decrease the temperature, we're gonna add a down arrow. It's gonna shift to the right, it's gonna generate more of the products. And the important thing to note about a temperature change is we are not only changing the amount of product in reactant, 
constant, but we're effectively changing the value of k because it's changing those two lowercase k's, uh, k forward and k reverse, and it's not changing them proportionally. So this is the one scenario where you actually change the value of k. And so again, concentration, volume, those don't do anything to perturb K. K is in fact changed by changing the temperature of the reaction. And so you can actually control whether it's going to generate more products or more reactants simply by heating up or cooling down the solution, depending on whether it's exothermic or endothermic. All right, the last one we're going to add on this list is adding a catalyst. Um, so we, we talked about catalysts previously. We know that a catalyst, the way it works is it effectively changes the mechanism and it lowers the activation barrier. And so while the activation barrier might have been this uncatalyzed, we add a catalyst and we're going to lower that barrier. But the thing about adding a catalyst is it changes the forward and reverse proportionally. So it changes it by the exact same amount of energy. And so the interesting part about this is it, adding a catalyst does not change the equilibrium at all. All it does is change how fast you get to that equilibrium. So you remember back to the earlier graphs where we talked about our reaction taking 500 years to reach equilibrium, add a catalyst and it can get to that equilibrium faster, but it does not change the final values. Those final values are dictated entirely by the energy of A or the energy of reactants and the energy of products. And so we'll get into that in chapter 16, but for now, the, the take home message here is catalyst can get you to equilibrium faster, but it will not change the equilibrium. And so here's basically a summary of everything we've talked about. How does changing concentration? Does it proceed to the right? Does it proceed to the left? Decreasing volume, increasing volume, it depends on the number of gas molecules on each side. If the number is equal, then it does nothing. Uh, temperature increase and decrease, it depends on whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic, which way it's going to shift the equilibrium. And it's also going to change the value associated with K. And so we're going to actually um, change the value of K. And so uh, catalyst does nothing to perturb uh, the equilibrium. It just gets you there faster. And so big take homes from this. The only thing that changes this value of capital K is temperature. And it's because it changes the lowercase k's uh, differently. Everything else, you are fixed by K at a given temperature. Everything else is responding to get back to that K. It's uh, basically all these changes are making Q greater than less than K. And it's going to go back to that K condition. And that's the foundation of Le Chatelier's principle. So that closes out our, our Le Chatelier's principle section. We're talking about changing concentrations, changing volumes, changing um, temperature and adding a catalyst and how we can use that to perturb the equilibrium. And so we'll close out chapter 13 with a little bit on equilibrium calculations in the next video.